So if you sit down with a meal and you know every single ingredient of what you're eating, that is well above and beyond what most people um, are doing today and will set you up for success in terms of knowledge. Because if you do find out that you don't know what you're eating, then you go find out. And then you become knowledgeable about the ingredients that you've already brought into your house or that you've been eating. Hey everybody, Dr. Axe here. Welcome to the show. I am so excited because I have a personal friend on the uh, episode today. It's Bonnie Hari, aka The Food Babe. She's the founder of Truvani, an amazing line of natural supplements. She's an author of a lot of books, including The Food Babe Way. I've got your new book here, Bonnie, called Food Babe Kitchen, which by the way, I just want to say, um, I was running around like a madman before our interview trying to find this book and I'm like, where is this? And I asked Chelsea, she's like, oh, I was reading it. So anyways, Chelsea was reading it and telling me how much she loved so many of the recipes. She said her exact words were, I am so excited about this cookbook. I flipped through it and I'm excited because I know I can trust the recipes. And so just know in the Axe household, you are a very trustworthy source. <laughs> and uh, for everyone else who doesn't know Vani, uh, I think most everybody does, but if you don't, the other thing that I love so much, Vani, Vani, that you've been able to do is you have gone to some of these big food companies, whether it be Kraft, Chick-fil-A, General Mills, these others, and you've really said, hey, you gotta do better. We, we, we gotta take care of our kids. We gotta take care of our future. And you can't keep putting this junk in our products. And you've actually, done something amazing. You've got these companies to actually change what they're putting in products. So anyways, like I love that you are on the front line. You're a leader of the natural health movement and I'm excited to chat today. Well, thank you so much, Josh. It's great to sit down with you because I tell you, um, when I met you for the first time, we were at a conference and I just immediately just, I remember we were, we were having tequila, I think. <laughs> Maybe. I'm uh, seven months pregnant right now. I'm not drinking tequila these days. But, um, and I just, I loved your whole mission and your vibe and what you really stood for. And then, you know, I didn't know much about you until I met you in person. So I met you first and then started following you and looking at your information and all the things that you have taught um, the, the world since then. And it's just amazing what you've created too. So, just so happy to be sitting down with you here today. Yeah, I know we're in a season of our life where we're having kids. I've got a five-month-old. And how, how old is your daughter now? She's three and a half. Three and a half, and you are pregnant now? Seven months pregnant, yeah. Wow, awesome. <laughs> Man, so exciting. And we just heard uh, my little one, Arwen, just uh, crying right before we jumped on. So she's going down for a, for a nap right now. So life, uh, you know, life changes. I know. And we were just talking about how you were planning to introduce real food around nine months. And I was going to ask you, how did, well, I'm going to turn the tables on you. I think you're supposed to be interviewing me, but I'm going to interview you now. But I'm going to ask you, how did you come up with that nine month mark? Well, honestly, it's very flexible. I think for us, like we always try and follow a lot of the ancient principles and ancient's more like when teeth come in. So it could definitely be closer to six. Um, I just know that it just really depends. So when teeth start coming in is when we will probably, or a month or so after, that's when we'll start introducing some food a little bit after the, the first teeth start coming in. And uh, I came up with that, not from a medical study. It's just the ancient things I've read in Chinese medicine and Ayurveda said, that's when you do it. So that's, that's great. Probably yeah, I mean, I got a lot of, I actually, I follow the same kind of principle. And so I, that's why I'm asking because I got a lot of like criticism from those around me and she was, uh, I think almost seven months when I started yep. and her first food was avocado. Um, and I went through every single vegetable first Yes. and I didn't even start with fruit um, at all. Actually, I didn't even, I don't think she had her first fruit until maybe eight or nine months or 10 months after we had cycled through kind of all the vegetables we we're bringing into our house and that we were growing in our garden. And, um, and I tell you, that was the best thing I ever did for that child because that, that little child, she will eat her vegetables before anything else on her plate. So it is absolutely incredible to watch. And you know, her favorite, um, recipe is actually in food babe kitchen. It's a bok choy recipe. 
because we, we were growing bok choy when she was born and it, we've just been growing it on our front porch like every season. And so she's just been around it. And, and so we've just always given it to her and she is her favorite and she just loves it. And we, you know, I saute it with a little bit of olive oil and garlic and lemon and, um, you know, and it's something my husband c can cook too. So it's like, you know, whoever's busy, not busy, you know, can get it, get it going on the stove and, um, she loves it. And it's, it's, it's not by accident. It's really what we expose our kids to. So we have, you know, we have such enormous power as parents in terms of how our kids eat. Well, I want to say one of the other things I love uh, and respect so much about you is I can tell you're an awesome mom. Like, I'm just saying that because I've watched you on Instagram some, just watch how you just care for your daughter. Again, I'll say, again, a lot of this is through social media, but there's just some things you can tell. So anyways, I love how thoughtful and, intent and intentional you are about just, you know, loving on your daughter, uh, just training her up in the way that she go and just her knowing like, hey, th this is what you know, you should be eating. Here's how you should be treating people. So anyways, I just, man, I just love that. And, uh, you know, I, I do, I want to jump in and just ask you some questions here. Uh, cause, um, I know a lot, a lot of our, I know a lot of my audience is so familiar with you and such a big fan of you. And I think, you know, one of the first things I think I read, I read an article when I first started reading your, your website years ago, Bonnie, I started reading you where you were really showing people here are the toxins hiding in your pantry. Like there's a lot of stuff hiding in there. You don't realize it. And so one of the things I'd love to start getting into and, and hearing about is what are some of those things? Like even today, I mean, you know, what are some of the things that are hiding in people's pantries or food products that are really, that people need to be aware of that are most toxic to us? And then one of the things I love is like, I want to go through your three detox questions uh, with that as well. Yeah, absolutely. So there's um, one ingredient, you know, there, there's several ingredients actually that the food industry has invented over the last 50 or so years that, you know, actually almost every single ing ingredient that has been added to our food over the last 50 years has, have, have only been invented for one sole purpose. And that is to improve the bottom line of the food industry. So it's not to actually improve our health or make us more nutritious. Um, and these additives have made, you know, there's over 10,000 additives in our food supply. They've made our way into every grocery store product process shelf that, you know, processed food that you see on the shelf. And, um, and so, you know, there's a laundry list of chemicals actually that we should be, be avoiding. Now there are certain, um, grocery stores, for example, Whole Foods, Earth Fair, and others. Earth Fair is coming back, by the way. It went out of business and it's coming back, so I'm mentioning that. Great news. Wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know. I love Earth, Earth Fair. Um, but they, you know, they had a laundry list of chemicals they just wouldn't even allow in their grocery stores, but a conventional grocery store would have. You know, obviously, you want to start with a list like that and make sure you don't have those ingredients in there. And I have a full laundry list of ingredients like that you should avoid in Food Babe Kitchen. But um, there's a couple of ingredients that we can discuss that are very, um, they, they are very innocuous. They, they seem okay, or you may not understand them or understand why they're there. And so you just allow them to continue to be in your food and you continue to eat those processed foods. And um, let's just talk about a few of them. The first one is actually an ingredient called monodiglycerides. It's uh, an emulsifying preservative that's added to a lot of bread and bakery goods and a lot of um, cookies and other things that you see on grocery store shelves. Now, this ingredient is actually something that you'll see in a lot of things because it's actually replacing the trans fats that these companies used previous to the FDA ban of trans fats, which, you know, five years, years ago, they made the ruling that they were going to remove trans fats from the American food supply. They gave companies, I believe, um, a certain amount of time to do that. Uh, you still see trans fats actually in foods today. Anything that says partially hydrogenated or hydrogenated um, can have uh, trans fats in them. It's linked to 20,000 heart attacks, 7,000 deaths every single year. And this just continued to be allowed in our food system until the FDA was actually sued to, to remove this chemical. 
um, and remove these chemicals. So, um, you know, you, it used to be the main ingredient in margarine. And now the food industry has found a different way to, to make a chemical act like a trans fat and still can contain minute amounts of trans fats in them without declaring it on the label. So a product can say zero trans fats, have monodiglycerides in it, and it still has trans fats. So that's one particular ingredient that I would scour your pantry for because it's, it's one of those things that you're like, oh, I'm just, this sounds, doesn't sound that bad and um, because it's in everything and you should probably be concerned with. The second one is something that, you know, I've had just, I have a, it is like a, um, I don't know, uh, I'm a very uh, adamant about never allowing artificial food dyes in my house, period. And the reason is, is because artificial food dyes, not only are they made from petroleum, um, but there's been several studies in a Southampton study that was conducted, and the reason why Europe actually stopped, started to remove artificial food dyes from their food supply and required a warning label is because that, you know, these food dyes were linked to hyperactivity in children and affected behavioral issues in the child's brain. And so when you buy a product in Europe, it says may cause adverse effects on activity and attention in children if it has artificial food dyes. And that to me is like a no-go. Anything that disrupts your brain in that way is a no-go ingredient first of all, whether it's a child or an adult or anybody. But, the, but there's three or four other reasons why artificial food dyes are really bad because a lot of times they can be contaminated with carcinogens. They, um, they also disrupt your immune system. Your, your liver doesn't know how to process these chemicals. So your body's being overloaded and be, can become very inflamed and, and, and disrupt your immune system. So you have an immune response to... Um, these this overload of chemicals in your diet and you know if you've noticed children's products out there They're full of artificial food dyes and we don't even know actually how much uh, Children are being exposed to artificial food dyes because they're just in every product marketed towards children everything from candy to waffles to cereal and That's a huge issue um, especially considering you know, we have a pandemic going on right now and we're supposed to be looking after our health you know, companies like Kellogg's, which I think is one of the most unethical companies that exist, has created new products this year with artificial food dyes, even though they made a commitment back in 2015 to remove artificial food dyes within three years. They said by 2018, we'll remove artificial food dyes from our cereals, from our products. They never did it. And instead have created new cereals, new cereals that target, you know, your daughter's going to be a to toddler soon. Baby Shark. I'm sure you've heard the song. <laughs> you might even play it for now. Oh man, we 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 actually played it on a road trip. She was crying, and we're like, you know what? <laughs> Chelsea actually told me she was like, we're going to the Baby Shark channel, and I'm like, what do you mean channel? I know I heard the song. But there's a whole channel, and anyways. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Oh yeah. I've listened Keep to it too. Started, but yeah. You gotta have the tunes on those car rides. I'm oh. telling you. So. Um, yeah, so baby shark cereal geared towards the littlest of children, right? Like that's the, that's like one of the first songs I feel like little children listen to right now. And, and they're, they're making a cereal, um, full of artificial food dyes, blue number one, red 40, et cetera. And, and this is just completely unethical because they're selling these same cereals overseas without these artificial, um, colors. And it's not like they have to reinvent their formula or come up with a new recipe or take time to develop this. They already are doing it. And they just continue to sell Americans the unsafe virgin because our government doesn't require the warning label. So that's one of my like non-negotiables. So a couple of ways I get, oh, you know, I think it's important to give um, all of your viewers, uh, Josh, like, you know, re realistic tips on how to avoid some of these things because they're like, well, what am I going to color my cake with? You know, when it's, when it's my daughter's birthday or my brother's birthday or whoever's birthday, well, they make some amazing natural food dyes now that are made from beets and blueberries and, you know, the greens coming from spirulina or spinach. 
And I just buy those. And even though I'm not using them all the time, I just kind of have them stocked in my pantry in case that occasion arises where I'm like, you know, oh, it's the holidays and we want to make something pink or green or whatever. I have those ready to go. Also, they make India Tree is another great brand that makes um, colored sprinkles. Now, I don't recommend <laughs> introducing sprinkles into your child's diet until it's absolutely necessary, until they actually ask for it, right? Like you, like it's, I don't think it's, see, that's the other power we have as parents is that, you know, these concoctions that have been created by the food industry to sell us products, we don't have to give into it, right? We don't have to, we don't have to buy this stuff. We don't have to go down that aisle at the grocery store, Right. Um, we don't have to bring it into our house. We don't have to expose our children to it, but eventually they will be exposed because let's just be realistic. They go to school, they go to friends' houses. Not everyone eats or drinks like you and I, Josh, or most of your viewers, I'm sure. So, um, so it's important to have those things as backup. And, and what I've realized is that instead of giving candy to my child, now she's three and a half. So she's really getting into kind of the, the fun types of foods and she sees a fun wrapper or some kind of you know when i was doing a campaign on kellogg's new waffles that were unicorn and mermaid she came over to my desk ran over here right here and sat here saw the the graphic that i was creating and we go she goes mom hmm, those look good and she's three you know and and it's like okay they're gonna see this stuff right so how can you make things fun? Well, I went and got these little Halloween toothpicks. You know, they have little witches on them and pumpkin faces and Frankensteins. And I've been putting those in her homemade, you know, muffins and waffles that I make for her and pancakes. And I make her French toast with like good Ezekiel bread in the morning or whatever before school. And so, um, you know, I still make it fun, but you don't have to have artificial food dyes to make things fun. You can use little toothpicks, other things, little toys, whatever to make food fun. So um, I just want to give parents those tips. And then the third kind of ingredient I want to talk about, and it's, it's one of those ingredients that makes it what it makes its way into just about everything. And those are just added flavors. Um, you know, just recently, a few years ago, the, again, the FDA got sued by the NRDC and some other nonprofit organization um, on seven different artificial flavors that were linked to cancer and um, had been in our food supply for a very, very long time. And they had done independent testing and, and seen that this, you know, these artificial flavors cause cancer in, in animal studies. And they lobbied to get these chemicals removed from the approved list of additives at the FDA. And they won, which was great, but the FDA gave these companies several years to remove these chemicals. And these artificial flavors can be found in, again, tons of products aimed at children. So if you have added flavors, you have to think a lot of these flavors are very controversial. They could be one of these banned um, flavors. Uh, food manufacturers don't have to tell you what's in their flavors. Now there's some companies that do use added flavors or different things and they tell you what's actually in them and that's great. But the majority, I would say 99% don't tell you, and that's a problem when you don't know what you're eating. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm with you. It's, it's crazy to see. And, and you were one of the first people that I really saw exposing this to the degree you'd exposed it to as uh, them going after kids. I mean, really, it's, it's where they get people in general starting very, at a very young age hooked to these products that they stay on for a good part of their life and get used to consuming which um, obviously is, you know, part of the reason why we have, I mean, you've seen the rates of diabetes growing in our kids today, the amount of kids with that, uh, that are diagnosed with obesity and even other, other conditions. I mean, thyroid disorders and autoimmune disease and pain. I mean, it's just, you know, it's totally mind blowing when you, when, when you look at the statistics, especially over a, you know, thir especially the last 30 years or so, how much these things have increased. You know, um, I know that one of the things that you really focus on is consuming a plant-based diet. And this is one of the things you do an excellent job of teaching your readers to do. Talk, talk to me about some of the foods you encourage them to stay away from. I know dairy is one, and I have a perspective on dairy I'll share too, that is probably gonna be, might be a little different, but also probably fairly in line with yours as well. But talk to me about dairy. When somebody, 
out there, if they want to consume milk or cheese or butter, what, what are your recommendations on how to approach dairy? So yeah, so I follow a primarily plant-based diet, but I still eat meat almost every day, right? Um, it's just I'm eating meat as a condiment, right? I'm not yeah. making it the main portion of my meal or even uh, several of my meals. Most of the time, I usually don't eat meat until dinner time, uh, and before that, it's it's plant-based fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, um, that kind of stuff. Um, but with dairy, I, it's the same way. It's as a condiment, right? It's not something that you're drinking a glass of milk at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and feeding that to your kids, or it's not something that you you know you have cheese at every single meal. I mean, if you look at the typical American diet, you know. Someone's eating yogurt in the morning, having some type of baked good that has probably some milk product in it. Or if you have a bacon, egg, and cheese or something like that, you've got the cheese product. Then at lunchtime, you might have a sandwich with a slice of Swiss cheese on it or something like that. And if you have a, a dessert, it would be an ice cream or something like that. And then at dinner time, you might have pasta and have cheese on top of that. And, you know, I mean, it's just, it can really overload your system. And what I've realized is when you keep dairy down, you actually keep inflammation down in your body as well, because there's just something about the way that it kind of slows your digestive system down. That's, it's not great. Um, that I found when I experiment with it. And with my daughter, we actually never introduced dairy until much later in life. We started giving her dairy towards the age of two. She just didn't tolerate it. Mm -hmm. um, she was breastfed for three and a half years. <laughs> she just <laughs> finished in July. Um, and um, all on her own, by the way, which was so magical to see. So tell Chelsea. Um, uh, just, it's really magical when kids wean on their own. It's, it's beautiful to watch because there's no effort of the mom. It's, it just happens. They're ready to do it. And, um, and it kind of caught me off guard, but, um, you hey, know, can I, just, I just wanted to say this too. Like one of the things again, um, be, you know, be, 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 being, being a man and not having a, again, I took care of a lot of patients over the years in my functional medicine clinic and moms and had conversations about their health and fertility and, and all of that. But one of the things that's been so unique is hearing Chelsea, like my sister was over here and they were talking about the bonding experience of, 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 of breastfeeding, which is just so amazing, you know, hear, hearing that. And so my sister, I think it was after a couple of years, um, they wanted to go on a, you know, on a trip and they, they felt like they were kind of ready. So just hearing like how difficult and emotional it was, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's an amazing, uh, amazing thing but you're you're literally co chemically connected to your child because of the oxytocin that you're getting every single time your child breastfeeds like you're literally getting a hit of like a drug a feel good drug that's like you're feeling so good and so much love and you don't want to be away from that at all and yeah. so for me it was very difficult to go away from um harley my daughter for the first, you know, while I was breastfeeding. And so I, I tried one day, actually when she was 10 months old, I left, it was when we were starting Truvani and I had to go uh, finalize the factory we were gonna use and the manufacturing. And I flew for the day and I, I, I remember getting all everything ready, pumping and doing this and doing that. And she just didn't drink any of the milk that I left and I was like, I'm never leaving again. The poor child was starved all day. And I said, I'm never leaving again. And so then I just took her with me everywhere I went. And I would have, you know, breastfeeding breaks in the middle of video shoots or conferences or whatever I had to go do. And then she became an amazing traveler. So she's been in nine countries and, um, wow. you know, yeah, so she's awesome. But, um, but I tell you, you don't, you, it's very hard to leave. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really tough. And so, yeah, my husband and I have not <laughs> had a night away <laughs> since having her. And then of course, now that I'm pregnant, it's, it's probably never going to happen. So we'll, 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 so we'll, we'll have those times again. We were married 14 years though. So, you know, we've had plenty of time together. <laughs> That's good. But again, you know, and I think that's one of the reasons too, I just want to say this again, I know I've already said this once, but like, this is another thing that I, I like, you know, I love about you and your mission and why we feel like, it, the reason why my wife earlier, why Chelsea was like, 
I trust Vani. It's like, we watched your videos. We follow you on Instagram. Like, we know how much you love your daughter and kids. I don't know how much we appreciate you teaching that to other people, watching out for people, and the fact that we can trust what you're putting out there, too. And I do want to give a shout out for anybody. If you guys want to get a totally awesome cookbook, Food Babe approved, Dr. Axe approved, get it. This is new. It's called Food Babe Kitchen. Uh, it's in bookstores nationwide, but also you can just go online. Go to Amazon.com and buy this, BarnesandNoble.com and buy this, FoodBabeKitchen.com, or go to FoodBabe.com. You can visit Vanny's, Vani's site there, um, and uh, Vani's a New York Times bestselling author. The thing that's great about this book is it's a combination. You have some really good content in the front of it. And the other thing I love is, is you do such a good job of food swaps. You know, I think giving people saying, hey, do this, not this, making those lateral shifts so where you're not stealing something from somebody saying, you can never do dairy again, or you can never do bread again, or you can never have a pancake or, a, you know, or tacos. You just give the healthier alternative. And also the thing, I thought you did a really good job in this book too. They're simple. Like some, now, you know, because I know you get the same thing too. I get multiple books in the mail uh, from from other authors every single week. And one of the things that most people do is they make it really complex. It's like, <laughs> hey, here's a recipe for chili. It's 78 ingredients. And it's like, well, it's going to take me like half of the week to make this. And it's not possible versus, hey, you got a, you know, a lentil salad here and it's got five ingredients, you know, and in a, in a, in a, in a, the vinaigrette has got like, you know, four or five. It just... That's one of the other things. So if you want a quick and easy meal, super healthy, family friendly, make sure to get Bonnie's book here, Food Babe Kitchen. You guys are going to love it. Well, what are some of the things that you love about this book? Well, you know, you talked about the, the first half being content. You know, the first 55 pages are how to create a food babe kitchen, right? How do you stock your pantry by going down every single grocery aisle and picking the right ingredients? Um, how do you remove the bad ingredients from your kitchen today? How do you cook with the right type of cookware that preserves the nutrition of the food and doesn't add any additional toxins? Um, you know, I go through all the specific things that you need to do in terms of what you're buying um, and what you're stocking your kitchen with. And then I go into specific things that I have done throughout the years to make myself healthier, everything from filtering my water to making sure I'm heating my food correctly and how to do that without a microwave. You know, people are like, well, I'm, I'm pressed for time. How do I not use a microwave? Well, I teach you in this book how not to use a microwave and what to do instead. I mean, I'll say this. I had somebody over now, this person didn't, you know, I didn't know very well and they were stopping in and they go, where's your microwave? And I almost thought like I, I've owned four, four homes, I think over the past, you know, many years and I haven't had a microwave in my house since I literally since I was an undergrad, like since I was 21, you know, so I haven't been around a microwave for like 18 years, but it's just funny, you know, it, it's funny to hear. One of the things I was reading about in the book I thought was awesome is you talk about your natural, like you have a sweet blend that you use. So talk about that because I think so many people have a sweet tooth and I think that's natural and normal. What, what are the ways that you suggest that we, you know, get away from the especially artificial stuff and what is your... The, you know, your secret sweet blend? Yeah, so um, one of the things that I just know kind of wreaks havoc on me is when I have uh, just an abundance of like refined sugar in my diet, like sugar just always makes me feel bad. I mean, it just kind of makes me depressed and, uh, and not that great. So I just try to avoid it as much as possible. And I'll still, you know, indulge in the occasional treat, especially being pregnant. You don't know when those cravings will hit and you need something. But um, on a regular basis, I really like to try to use whole real foods to create the sweetness in, in the food that I eat. Like for example, the muffins that I make for my daughter have just banana in them, you know, or I'll put some dates in there too to sweeten it up. I might put a sprinkle of honey or something in there if I'm putting an interesting ingredient like spinach in the muffin because I'm experimenting with a new recipe. Um, and I used a little bit of honey in there and I mean, they taste phenomenal and they're green and I call them Frankenstein muffins. But um, 
but it's, you know, it's, uh, you know, when, when I'm using like a vegetable, I don't feel as bad using some honey or, or maple syrup or something natural, an unrefined sugar in my cooking. But one of the ways I figured out how to make cookies and not use any refined sugar is to do um, kind of this combination of, um, uh, you know, if you look at any cookie recipe, it always starts with creaming the butter with the sugar, you know, in the mixer, right? Cream the butter and the sugar, right? Well, instead of creaming the butter and the sugar, I cream together coconut oil, chopped dates, and chopped prunes. And when you put that in a blender, it tastes and smells like a Samoa cookie. Wow. Um, if you've ever had one of those Girl Scout cookies that are like so delicious. I don't eat them anymore, but I remember what they taste like. And, um, and it just smells so good and it tastes so good. And then you can put the other ingredients, the baking soda and the, you know, and the oats or, or whatever else you're using. And in my, um, one of my favorite cookie recipes called Forever Cookies, I use um, kind of ground up almonds or any kind of ground up nut as part of the flour base. So you're also getting that really good fat in the cookie too. So it, so when you eat one or two of these cookies, you're done. You're not eating the whole, you know, the whole batch of cookies. But if I were to make chocolate chip cookies the traditional way with the butter and the sugar, I probably would eat six or seven because you're getting that spike of insulin from that sugar and that white flour versus now I'm eating oats, almonds, dates, prunes, coconut oil you get that fat and then you know and it just tastes so good and they're they taste like cookies but but i don't overindulge and i'm also adding a ton of nutrition to my body so my brain is telling me hey you're satisfied you're good i love it that's so good i mean dates are a fantastic natural sweetener and i love that idea of mixing those with the coconut oil um blending those up and what was the other thing you said with the coconut oil you add it with uh, prunes. That's right. Prunes. Okay, great. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's something about dates. If you add a little bit of something like a cinnamon or a pumpkin pie spice there too, especially. Yeah. There's cinnamon in the cookies too. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. So, so good. So what are a few of your favorite, and then I actually have some other questions I want to ask you about here as well, but I want to just hit on a few other things. What is one of your favorite regular recipes and one of your favorite dessert recipes you've got in your in your book here? By the way, one of my favorite things, I love, I love these goji berry drops. I think these look awesome. We're going to try these out this week. Oh, it's it's amazing. But you have to remember to toast the almonds because toasting okay. the almonds just takes it up a notch. Right. And you might overindulge in those. I'll just have to tell you, um, even though they have the good fats from the almonds, I eat like three or four of those in, in one sitting because they're so good because the you get that chewy, caramely uh, flavor from the goji berry. Yeah. And then you get the crunch from the almond, and then you have the little bit of sea salt and the chocolate, and oh, those are so good. Um, but th they're such a treat, and they're so, I mean, there's, I mean, there's basically barely anything bad in there. You know, there's a little bit of refined sugar from the chocolate, but that's it. And, um, and yeah, I mean, goji berries are incredible for your eyesight, for fertility, for um, your immune system. I mean, goji berries have, uh, you know, from ancient Chinese medicine, tons of health benefits. So oh. it's a great, great treat. Yeah, I mean, goji berries were the most prized berry in all of China. I mean, for anti-aging, longevity, it's, uh, you know, they were put in their supplement formulas. They called it lysium, but it was, it was just goji berries. So, yeah, I mean, it's... I grow them actually in my backyard. So we eat fresh goji berries all the time. Wow. Remember, you're, are you in South Carolina? North Carolina. Oh, you're in North Carolina. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So um, those two recipes, one regular and then what's one of your favorite desserts? Um, so, okay. One regular. Um, okay. So this is actually not my recipe, but it's my mom's. Okay. So um, one of the things I had... I had to have in my cookbook is the, the meal that she basically makes for me and my family every week and invites us over for dinner. Um, my parents live just right down the road. And so um, for so many years, I just shunned my, my mother's cooking because it didn't look or feel like American food. And all I wanted to do was kind of fit in. And I was one of the only Indian children in my school. And so I just, she still continue, like made homemade Indian food every single day, but I just decided, and she let me eat the fast food and all of the 
garbage food that was available at the grocery store and packaged processed food that you put in the microwave, the Salisbury steak, the fry daddy, mozzarella sticks, all of that stuff. And, um, and she, you know, she just didn't know because she came from India as an immigrant. She didn't really understand what had been done to the food supply here in America. She just thought this was American food. She didn't know how to cook it. So she allowed the processed food industry to help her out. Um, but, and, and this is one of the reasons why I am where I am today is because I went through that situation where it really was very detrimental to my health for, for half of my life. You know, I'm 41 now for at least half of my life, I was very sick. And um, it wasn't until I found real food that I changed my life around. So now that I know how amazing Indian food is for you and all the medicinal spices and the way it's home cooked and made from scratch, I enjoy it so much and I love it. I love the taste of it. It's my favorite kind of food. And so I had to have her give me her recipes for the book. And she's actually in the book with my daughter making these, but um, it's these kale pranthas is what, this, what the recipe is called. And what she does is she, gr she takes kale from her garden. You don't have to have it from your garden, but you can have it from the grocery store or wherever and grinds it uh, in a blender with a little bit of water. And then she weaves that into a dough and makes flatbread. And the flatbread is a little bit green and you get a ton of kale in it. And my daughter loves it, and she eats little bites of that with grass-fed butter. And it's like the perfect meal. Wow. And she loves it. I love it. Um, my mom also makes a lentil dish along with it, and, this, um, and also curry um, cauliflower, gobi. And all those recipes are in the book, along with one of her um, prized desserts, carrot hulva, which is a carrot-based dessert. Oh, yeah. um, with, uh, you know, some dairy and some grass fed butter. Um, but it's, it's really, really good. And I just love that meal. And so I, I, that's gotta be my favorite. <laughs> oh man. I love, I mean, we love Halva here. We, one of our, one of my closest friends, uh, he's an acupuncturist. He, he's, he, uh, came over from Israel. Uh, his name's Gil Banami. In fact, I referenced him in one of a new book I've got coming out as well. And so we go over to his house and he, I mean, he makes the best, I mean, just fantastic halva. So I'll just share this recipe with him. He, he's a, uh, you know, a, a chef at heart. And so I'll, uh, I mean, he'll be excited to, to check this out too. So buddy, we, we talked about a lot of stuff. One of the last things I want to say is like, so can you walk me through to, there's a lot of information out there, you know? And I think one of the things that I, I there was something that struck me when I first opened up my clinic, which I'm no longer in practice, but when I had it, and I was taking care of all these families, the biggest thing I really felt early on was people are overwhelmed, especially moms. Like, and I had that mom growing up, and I think part of the thing, part of the thing that made her uh, sick early on in, 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 uh, in my life when she was raising me is that, you know, she was overwhelmed. She had so much going on, and then all these choices, almost kind of so many conflicting viewpoints and this and that. She almost didn't know what to do. What sort of advice do you have? Or where can somebody start? Is somebody saying, you know what, like, I'm not really big time into health, but I want to, I want to learn. I want to do better. I want to raise, I want to be healthier myself. I want to raise healthier kids. What are some of the initial, like, what are the Vani Hari, like, what are the ba food babe baby steps, point one, two, three, or it could be just one point or it could be four, whatever you want. Or what are some of those first steps that people can take saying, hey, um, I'm ready to make a change? Well, you know, this book definitely would help them tremendously um, just because, again, the first 55 pages is all how to set up your kitchen for success. And I would say cooking from home is uh, and cooking with your own ingredients and what you know what you're eating will just fundamentally change your life. Um, and that's why I knew I had to write a cookbook. And I waited for so long because my first publisher wanted to produce a, cup, a cookbook that was black and white. And I had to get out of that contract and begged my agents to help me do that because um, I just couldn't see a black and white cookbook even resonating with people. People have to be able to see the food and how beautiful it is and easy to make and yeah. see the pictures, right? Um, kind of eat with your eyes. So uh, I'm so glad I waited and got the right publisher to do this and you know, that saw my vision. But I have this um, kind of formula at the end of my second book, Feeding You Lies, that I take people through that really um, simplifies how you should eat. And um, 
you know, the only people that have really made food complicated in the last um, several years have been the food scientists themselves, right? They, they're the ones who have made it very complex because we have to read ingredient labels. We have to figure out what these chemicals are. You know, we got to protect ourselves, right? They're the ones who have made it complicated for us. But if we just go back down to our roots and ask ourselves three fundamental questions, I call it the three question detox, three fundamental questions about every single meal you eat. If you were to do this exercise for three days, a week, maybe even less, um, it would fundamentally start to change your mind about what you're eating. And the first question you would ask yourself is, what are the ingredients? So if you sit down with a meal and you know every single ingredient of what you're eating, that is well above and beyond what most people um, are doing today and will set you up for success in terms of knowledge. Because okay. if you do find out that you don't know what you're eating, then you go find out, right? You go find out, oh, you know, I've been eating this bar, you know, or whatever every day at snack time. And I have, you know, the label's not even on it. The label's on another package. I need to go find out what this is, right? And then you may come across monodiglycerides, which we've already talked about. And, and you might say, well, gosh, I didn't know that it had that. I don't know what that is. And, and then you go find out, you Google it. Thankfully, we have a lot of information at our fingertips. And then you become knowledgeable about the ingredients that you've already brought into your house or that you've been eating. So what are the ingredients? Then you want to ask yourself, are these ingredients nutritious? Well, let's say that monodiglycerides are in your food. Well, you know that that's not nutritious now because you've been listening to this podcast and you know, you know that that has trans fats that are linked to 20,000 heart attacks and 7,000 deaths. It's not something that you should be eating on a regular basis. So maybe you'll make a different choice next time. But say you were also eating an apple at that meal, you can just use your common sense to know that an apple is nutritious, has tons of vitamins, minerals, fiber, et cetera, that, you know, benefits the body. And then the third question is, where do these ingredients come from? And this is fundamental when it comes to avoiding toxins in our food and pesticides. You know, is the apple that you're eating coming from a conventional farm where it was sprayed with 32 different toxic pesticides? Or was it an organic farm? Um, was the monodiglyceride bar that you were eating coming from a factory or a chemical lab? Was it created, was it, you know, created to sit on a shelf for 12 months at a time? Um, and, and you start to ask yourself these fundamental questions. So if you, if you sit down at every meal and just have those three questions kind of laid out and you can answer those questions truthfully and, or you can find out the answer, then the next time you sit down, you'll think about it a little bit more, um, uh, proactively, but you also will become uh, you become a savvy kind of nutritionist, uh, armchair nutritionist, you know. And I, I just really don't think you need to be a nutritionist or doctor to know how to eat. I think it's very it's very common sense when you just investigate your food. Yeah, I love it. Fantastic advice, and I love it. The big thing is know what you're eating. You know, know what you're actually putting in your body. You look at the ingredients label, and it's more than fat and carbs and protein. That's what a lot of people look at. More important than the fat and carbon and protein uh, label is the actual ingredients in there that you're seeing real food. I love that advice. Now, one of the other things I know that you take to cover your bases is you do take some supplements. I know that, uh, again, I've seen uh, you do you know, your videos. And by the way, another place you guys need to follow Body is on her Instagram page or Facebook page. So Instagram, uh, Food Babe, right? It's just Food Babe, right? The Food Babe. The, the Food Babe uh, on those Instagram handles. So make sure, and, and Facebook handles, make sure to check her out there. Talk to me about collagen. Is that something, first off, I mean, if, if somebody sees you, they're going to say, you got, you know, you got a lot of great hair, you know? And, <laughs> and I know when I take collagen, I've got like, you know, my nails, my hair grows fat. Like, is that, is that something you're using on a regular basis in the, uh, you know, in, in the, in your, in your house? Yeah, that's actually one of the first products um, we created at Truvani because I found, um, well, for me, it's really, uh, for me, I have not eaten beef since I was 14 years old. So I haven't been able to enjoy all the other collagen products like at Ancient Nutrition and others that they've made out of beef. Um, and so for me, it was really important to create um, a collagen from marine. 
um, from, uh, we actually get it from fish uh, caught off the coast of Iceland and France, um, different cod, uh, various cod and, and other fish, but to make the collagen. And, um, and that was really important to me. So that was one of the products we first created so that I could have the benefits of collagen. Yeah. Um, you know, I of course have my bone broth and other things like my chicken bone broth that I make at home, et cetera. But um, I wanted to have a supplement collagen that I could take um, on a regular basis. And I, I, I love that product. It's, it's absolutely phenomenal. And, you know, one of the reasons I started Truvani is I found out and, and I'm, sure Josh you saw this in, in the, what you've done as well is you know so many of my supplement brands that I loved were being just bought out by big conglomerates and um, and then they would change the ingredients and they would add synthetic chemicals and some other things to just you know obviously make more money and so that was something that really bothered me and that happened actually with my turmeric supplement and it's one of the reasons why um, that was actually our first product at Truvani that we created. Um, and I'm just super proud of what we've done there. And we've got 10 new products coming uh, coming very soon. So it's very exciting. And um, and as you know, you learn so much. Um, you know, you learn a lot being an activist and kind of pressuring these companies from the outside. But you really learn about the food industry when you produce your own products and understand how they are made and all the intricacies that are involved in the supply chain. And um, yeah, it, it, it's made it, me so smart. Yeah, and, and I think that you learn a couple things. One, it's difficult. Number two, it's not impossible. Yeah. You know? And it just, it's more work. And I know you, you and I are in alignment on this. My business partner, Jordan, it's like, I know when, whether it's ancient nutrition or Trevani, when we're creating supplements, there's that thing of like, Hey, not everyone makes it easy, but you know, I know both of us, we're traveling the world, searching the globe to find the best quality ingredients to put on our products. Because I think the thing that we have in common here too, is it's like, we're creating these products for our families. Like these are the products we take, like you're taking collagen that you made, that you found over, you know, in Iceland and France, same thing for us, like where we're sourcing ours in Ar Argentina, Europe and Alaska and some of the other places too. It's like, it matters to us. Like we really, really care. And so I think that's, again, one of the things I love so much about you and your mission. It's like, you care, you know, you care about the content you put out. You care about fighting these big companies that are bullying their way and taking advantage of children. You care about all the things you make. And so one of the other things I just encourage everybody to do too is, um, you know, uh, fight for yourself, fight for your family. Like, again, know that like, it's not like it's, they haven't made it easy for us, but I actually think it's easier now than it was 15 years ago, you know, to eat healthy. That's the other advantage. It's like, there are places like Chelsea and I go to right down the road here, true food kitchen, you know, there's whole foods market. There's, there's a lot of great options today, you know? Yeah. There's definitely way more options now as a result, I think of your work, my work, the collective, um, community that the health community that has pushed this information out to the public so they understand the value of real food and um and now you know you can go to costco which is actually the largest producer of organic foods and get a ton of organic food at a very low cost for your family and you weren't able to do this many years ago so you know things are much different you know i wrote a blog post when i quit my job to do food babe full time i was not making a dime doing food babe and um it was just a passion project and so the first thing i did was figure out how to buy organic on a budget and i wrote this blog post 75 ways to eat organic on a budget many of those tips unfortunately are become obsolete because now it's just more readily available and you don't have to you know really work on figuring this out you can just go to trader joe's or costco and, and get Pretty, pretty awesome prices on stuff in, in places like Thrive Market um, that you can order online. So, you know, we, we are in a good spot. Um, things have definitely gotten better. And, you know, just the importance of farmer's market. And, and I just have to say this, when you grow your own food, it's like printing your own money. There you go. I tell you. That's good. Actually, we have Chelsea and I just moved into a new house. And so I was with our uh, somebody who's helping uh, do our landscaping. And so we're, you know, doing planters in our back. So years ago, I started my first garden. Uh, we lived in a, just a city outside of Nashville called Nolensville. And um, I planted all these beds of stuff. 
Chelsea, we were just dating. Uh, actually, I think we were engaged at the time. I, I was dog sitting because she had to go. She was finishing up school watching our dog Oakley. And um, he literally ripped down every single, you know, every single plant I had out there. I let him out there for an hour and came back. And he was, anyways, it was all dead. So I'm looking forward to, you know, round two here of actually doing our first garden. Because, uh, anyways, we haven't had a yard in between now and then, but we do now. So, anyways, it's, uh, I'm excited. So <laughs> it sounds like you need to build your planters a little taller. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're going to use your book here to, uh, you know, for, for when we have the garden, but we're going to try out some stuff here. So, well, hey, I want to encourage everybody if you guys want a cookbook and just a general book on, hey, how, how to get healthy now, some great tips that I trust and my wife Chelsea trusts. Uh, check out her new book, uh, Vonnie's here. It's Food Babe Kitchen. You can go to a local bookstore or, hey, just order online. You got Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com. You can go online and order this book right now. Vani's a New York Times bestselling author. The content, the first 55 pages of this book are fantastic going over how to make over your kitchen the Food Babe way and um, more than 100 real food recipes that are short and easy. They're not 50 ingredients. It's more like five, so you're going to love the new book. And Vani, want to say you're awesome again. And, and I... And I just want to say again, like, I know I've said this several times, but I really do sincerely appreciate you being on the front lines because you have literally led the charge in getting giant corporations, multi-billion dollar corporations to change what is in the food supply today. And we've got to keep fighting these people. But again, I just appreciate you being on the front lines and all you're doing. And I also appreciate you being a good friend. We got a box from you with some goodies here recently. And uh, Chelsea wants to say thank you as well. And so, uh, anyways, man, just so so so, uh, so good. Chad, any any last words of hey, where people can find you or, or any other thoughts? Sure. You know, if you want to know every single thing in my pantry, I'm actually giving away a list of that um, when you pre-order the book or when you get the book. Um, foodbabekitchen.com. You can just submit your receipt from Amazon or wherever and and get that list. Um, sent to you right away. Um, and, uh, you know, just uh, come on over to foodbabe.com, see what we're doing. You know, I've got an active petition right now on Kellogg's to, re- to finally commit to removing our artificial food dyes. Um, you can check that out at foodbabe.com slash baby shark. Um, and, you know, I was supposed to fly and deliver those petitions actually this spring, but then, you know, the pandemic hit and kind of canceled my plans and now I'm pregnant. So I'm not going anywhere for a little while, but as soon as I'm able to, I'm going to be delivering those petitions to Kellogg's. And if you live near Battlefield, um, Michigan, come join me. (laughs) All right. I love that. Well, again, Vani, hey, thanks so much. Thanks everybody for listening uh, to another episode and we'll be back next week with another podcast. Thanks again to Vani Hari, The Food Babe and check out our new book, Food Babe Kitchen. This podcast is for information purposes only. Statements and views expressed in this podcast are not medical advice and have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. In some cases, individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to herein. 